are these people? Not many people talking about the fact that it's now been three weeks. Bowie workers walked off the job and have been picketing and on strike. Thousands of them. So this is Left Voice Indie Media Award honoree. Um, Sam Carlin, we've, mm. we've read a couple of his stories before, both at Left Voice and at other publications. But I brought this one because he, he lives in New Jersey. He lives actually close to me. And he flew out to Washington and Oregon and did like a four-day tour where he interviewed and sat on the picket a lines. three-hour tour? No, it was more than a three hours. It was a three-day tour or more. And he went... Three-hour tour. No, it wasn't Gilligan's Island. He was sitting on the picket lines <laughs> with, with, with Boeing, uh, with the Boeing employees talking to them and standing in solidarity. So here's what he saw. So okay. he says, when I booked a trip to the PNW back in April, I didn't think for a second that it would align perfectly with the largest strike in the United States so far this year. I just thought I'd be hiking and see the world's largest rubber chicken in Seattle. But then 33,000... Oh, why wouldn't you? Well, naturally, but 33,000... 33,000 33, machinists at Boeing voted overwhelmingly to strike despite the International Association of Machinist Bureaucracy pushing workers to accept the sellout contract. Less than a week later, I was lucky enough to meet some of the workers on the picket lines. The flight from Newark to Seattle was six hours on a Boeing plane, so even before reaching the picket, I was reminded <laughs> of just how different mine and so many people's lives would be if it were not for the machinists these workers build, the machines that these workers like build. I feel like if he's coming from Newark, you have to just do it in a New York Newark accent the whole time. I just want this whole article to sound like The Sopranos, you know? So I read it like I... I what do my, I know? I read it in my own voice is <laughs> what you're saying? Yeah, okay. pretty much, yeah. So I went to Newark. I went, I went from Newark to Seattle. So I fucking went to <laughs> Newark. Anyway... I went to fucking Newark. Right, exactly. <laughs> I went to fucking Newark after picking up a fucking rental car. The fucking, fucking unions, meal. they're busting our balls again. And a quick fucking the meal. The planes, they're falling out the sky. I saw Johnny Sack and went straight to the picket line at the Boeing factory in Wenton, Washington. <laughs> Just outside Seattle. Uh, Renton, Renton, Washington, I believe, also is the headquarters for, for Microsoft. Um, right. As I drove by to find parking, picketers were dancing along the sidewalk. Before my trip was over, I'd go there once more and also visit a picket in Portland. So September 17th, he says, I don't think I've ever strolled up to a more energetic picket line. Now, Sam has covered a lot of strikes and picket lines. So for him to say that, that actually yeah. does have weight. As I approached the big tent, mm -hmm. surrounded by a large crew of workers and their families, someone greeted me with, welcome to the block party. It sure felt like one. Right. With all sorts of food, from pizza to freshly grilled sausage and blanketing, two folding sausage. tables. Hey, you asked for Jersey. All right. <laughs> I know, dude. And blanketing, two folding tables and loud hip hop mm. blasting from a speaker. The energy from the workers was matched by the constant stream of cars passing by and honking in solidarity. Very cool. Asian, black, and white workers were dancing, laughing, and talking with one another. It was a beautiful reminder that despite stereotypical depictions of the working class in the United States as mainly chauvinist white men, U.S. workers are diverse and nothing breaks down the real racial divisions of our class like a shared struggle on the picket line. I, grabbed a, I grabbed a sign at the curb, uh, soaking it up. Pretty early on, it became clear that the vehicles were still regularly driving in and out of the facility, almost always honking or raising their fists in solidarity with the workers on strike. Even though these drivers were still helping Boeing run, breaking the strike technically, the striking machinists seemed to mainly just appreciate the honks from these workers and see them acting in solidarity. After about an hour, I spoke with a machinist who works at the end of the line, checking the quality of the product. He was practically bursting with excitement to be on the picket line. It was his first ever strike. He was ecstatic that I'd come all the way from New Jersey to support, yelling every few minutes at his coworkers, they came all the way from Jersey! <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
As I was yeah, leaving, that's great. I walked past signs taped to a large traffic pole reading, The Union Sold Us Out and 2014 All Over Again. The latter referring to the 2014 contract that passed by a mere 51% due to pressure on workers from the union leadership. That gave away their, their pension benefits, which is one of the things they're trying to get back. There were also signs encouraging a no vote on this recent contract that the union had been pushing prior to the strike. Another reminder that if the workers win, it'll be from the fight that the rank and file puts up. All right. And there's more to this. I just, again, clipped some snippets and some real good highlights. There's a much longer article. He says, I returned the, the following evening in Renton to a much different scene. Maybe it was just a weird day in time for Pickett. Maybe it was because that was the day that Boeing and the union returned to negotiations, which are closed to the rank and file. Maybe it was the news of Boeing furloughing thousands of white collar employees. Whatever the case, far fewer people were out on the picket line and the mood was much more passive. I arrived at the location where there had been just about 80 people celebrating the day before. This time there were just five workers holding it down, not talking to each other much. Though occasionally one would crack a joke to one another, despite the small numbers, these workers seem to be in good spirits. So this is the one from when they were 80, and there's that tent where they were yeah. blasting the music and everything, right? He says, later on, I heard a younger worker telling his fellow picketers about his typical work shift, which starts around 2 a.m. and runs through the morning. He said, it's not too bad. But he and his co-workers joked that if he wants a girlfriend, he'll have to meet her in the factory and take her on a date in the cafeteria. All right. A worker who'd been there a decade at least replied, I've seen this work break up so many families, referring to the long hours that seem to be the norm for most of the machinists. I mean, that seems like the romantic comedy that Boeing will put out to try and well <laughs> the negative press. Of the, coming to you, you know? on Amazon Prime TV. Absolutely. <laughs> because Amazon does right. the same shit exactly. to their employees. Right? An Amazon yep. worker and a Boeing <laughs> worker, they should actually have like a dating game where an Amazon worker, they pair an Amazon yeah. worker and a Boeing worker because they'll never get to meet otherwise. All right? Yeah. While it didn't come up at the pickets, there has been much reporting on how Boeing uses forced overtime to make workers labor for long hours with some workers spending 70 hours a week at the factory. Kind of hard to pick it if you're working 70 hours a week. <laughs> yeah. All right. Then, yes, a rom-com. Exactly, Heidi. So so we'd have, we, it would be a rom-com. Yeah. Or I, I think Meg it would Ryan, be... Meg Ryan and... Uh, Sleepless in a Warehouse. Yeah, exactly. Sleepless in a Warehouse. Great, you win. You win. Go home. Thank you. you. Win. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Because that's how they feel, I'm sure. Well, no, they want the hours a week. Right. You're definitely going to be fucking sleepless. And they wanted For to sure. sleep. They wanted to sleep there too. Um, <laughs> we'll we'll provide you a date to the cafeteria. Oh God. Yeah, they'll get, yeah until they install the vibrating collar that keeps you awake. Well, you know, better than the exploding oh. collar. I'll take that. Mm -hmm. <sighs> September 21st he drives down the 101 and he goes to Portland where he had the opportunity to check out another picket at a different Boeing factory this one's smaller than the first one about 30 more than the, for the more than the second one of five but it ended up being the most overtly friendly picket of the three not surprised the lefties in Portland and you know they have a, a history and a reputation for being welcoming Yep. Just about everyone along the sidewalk outside the factory was smiling as I pulled up, which is weird considering they're on strike and not earning money. I, arri yeah. I arrived at a small tent with two people and we immediately started talking. I asked how they felt about the strike. One said she'd start looking for work soon because she didn't want to be sitting around with nothing to do. The other seemed more content, adding, we've had years to prepare for this. I soon learned from conversations that this factory in particular had about a thousand workers. And while the strike was taking place, there were four scabs inside trying to fill the tests of about 30 something people and operate the machines that they had mm -hmm. no clue how to use. <laughs> what, 
What a shit show. I was also happy to uh, learn that this picket had received local support from many other unions, including firefighters, representatives from the local AFL-CIO, and the Society of Professional Engineering Employees in Aerospace, to name a few. Plenty of passing cars also showed solidarity with their horns. That's great. So one worker says, I think how these negotiations will go affect how all negotiations in the future goes. Because if Boeing can get away with cutting retirement, what's stopping other companies from doing it? And if, and if they can go after healthcare, other companies will too. He clearly understood this strike, yep. not just as a fight for himself and his coworkers, but for the larger labor movement. Solidarity. So far, now he also wanted to note, there have only been a few examples of connections being made between the striking Boeing machinists and the anti-imperialist movement for Palestine. Because he also, he is a very uh, strong anti-imperialist, anti-Zionist, and he wants to see people make that connection and wanted to observe, have they been making that connection at the picket lines or even talking about the fact that what they're doing is funding a genocide? Well, not really, all right? The bureaucratic control of the union leadership is also likely to present an obstacle to more militancy in Boeing workers whether it be the workers taking an anti-imperialist stance um, or organizing the strike from the rank and file, all right, despite these limits, Sam says he can't help but feel moralized by these picket lines and what they show about the growing desire of the U.S. working class to fight for everything we deserve. And I've, look, I've been an advocate since the day I got on a microphone for shutting it down. General strike started by a trucker strike. And the, the truckers in Canada showed the way. And they had to withstand being demonetized and debanked for it and demonized in the press. Yep. But they did it. I mean, any of those, the longshoremen, the well, airplane company, like transport and good services and really shut down the entire economic system. You're well, talking could mm -hmm. be effective for a lot of things if you had your demands right. What So what do I do? It. We just covered tonight 85,000 East Coast mm -hmm. dock workers and 30,000 machinists for Boeing. That's a start. Yeah. That's a good head start. All right. And forget about May 1st, 2028, like Sean Fain wants. Fain, by the way, is also talking about putting a, a Stellantis on strike because they have welched already on the agreement that they signed with him a year ago during the quote unquote bullshit stand up strike that I called out every day. All right. But they've already yeah. closed the plant and laid off temporary workers that they said they wouldn't lay off per the contract. And how's he going to hold them accountable yeah. to that? He's not the, the sit down strike. You mean? Yeah. The only way to do that is to walk his wor mm -hmm. workers off the job and, and start paying them strike pay. And I don't know if he's even got authorization from the workers themselves at Stellantis to do that yet. Um, but like I like like I keep saying, we are suppressed, we are demonetized in most places, and we certainly need your support, your dollars, and there's a bunch of different ways to do that. Best way is Cash App. They don't take any fees, and it goes right into our bank accounts within a couple of days. Go-fee.com slash Indie News Network. PayPal.me slash Indie News Network. Use that QR code up above Reese Head. Rumble.com slash C slash Indie News Network. If you go to the uh, YouTube.com slash IND Left News, you can leave a super chat or a tip there. There's also Patreon.com slash Indie News Network. And that's not to say anything of all of my own personal ones that you can also tip at Indie Media Today or at patreon.com slash IND Left News and everywhere else.com slash IND Left News. My we apologies. Got a, we got a nice hookup from Carnival Hill to the PayPal this week. Um, we also got a re-sign up from James Arkazuski over on the Substack. So thank you so much. Um, really appreciate all the support. We need it all. Every dollar counts.